Welcome everybody um, to our second session of the year. So this evening I'm going to give a, uh, a talk on Girard's last book, his book called Battling to the End, uh, which is kind of a book about history and about war and about conflict, but also about religion. Um, and I think hopefully tonight, well, I'll say last time we kind of exploded and we threw the MMA structure to the walls and it was this kind of crazy Dionysian mob of Cadell and uh, Tolna shouting at each other. Let's see how tonight goes. I think the plan is to be a little bit more structured tonight and save some time for breakout rooms to kind of think and digest this stuff. But with that said, let's not waste any time. Let's dive in. So I've actually borrowed Thomas's slide here just as a little recap about one of the things one of the kind of cores of mimetic theory that we're thinking about. So there's this idea that we get into conflict with each other over objects. Someone appears to have something that I want. So say I'm Nietzsche and Wagner appears to have music. He's very skillful at music. And so I want to get the music. I see him having music and I also want music. And that can be a productive relationship so long as there's a certain degree of distance between us, as long as I see, say, Wagner, see my model as a teacher. But if I shift into this thing that Girard designates as metaphysical desire, which is this idea that I no longer want the object so much as I want the being of Wagner itself, it's like Wagner is the god of music and I want to be Wagner, then I set myself up for a pretty painful relationship or I'm just going to oscillate between total kind of desire to be Wagner and to almost dominate Wagner and then the total feeling of of not being him and the depression and the sense of failure and not being good enough and as Thomas actually pointed out this can kind of be seen in the philosophy of Nietzsche in his kind of talking about the will to power that's the kind of sense of dominating and being the thing that I want to be, or the resentment, which is that feeling of incredible distance and frustration with it. Now, Girard reckons that this dynamic is at the foundation of culture. Like at the left here, we see the picture of the myths of Cain and Abel, the idea that these two brothers got into competition over the blessing of God. And it eventually led, I always forget which way round it was. I think it's Cain who kills Abel. It might be the other way around. Um, but basically this murder, this founding murder at the kind of core of history. And I mean, it's interesting that founding murders show up in other stories too. So it's not just a biblical account. The history of Rome, for example, mythologically starts with these two brothers, Romulus and Remus, getting into a fight and killing each other. Well, one killing the other, rather. Cain kills Abel. Then on the right-hand side here, what we have is this idea of the foundation of religion itself. So we've got multiple people stoning one person. Gerard's theory was that if a group of people enter into this mimetic conflict with each other, increasingly wanting the objects that each other have wanting to be each other, but also fighting each other for it. The solution to it is to find one person, or one minority who they can agree to unanimously hate and all take part in killing or expelling or eradicating them together. Now, the idea also is that this scapegoating mechanism in pacifying the community then actually produces quite a profound divine, you could say, effect, which is that all of a sudden everything's, everything's calmed down a bit. And so his theory is that archaic people actually then came up with a name for a god to describe that dynamic. And so this ritual became associated with a god, be it Apollo or Dionysus or whatever, and then regular sacrifices were made to this God, repeating this ritual in a sense to appease the God and to, to kind of let the pressure off from this mimetic rivalry. Christianity comes onto the scene, however, and turns this thing on its head because the Christian revelation, what comes out in Christ, 
is actually the idea of the innocence of the scapegoat. So God is no longer the force that comes from the community unanimously killing and expelling someone who they all agree is guilty. God is rather the innocent scapegoat himself. And then I put also here on the right hand side, the Ten Commandments as a reminder that one of the theories of religion and particularly religious prohibition is the idea that the commandments that thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, etc., are there to prohibit the most mimetic objects, to stop people from competing for the things that we most commonly compete for, like objects of love, objects of desire, and wealth, things like this. So it's interesting just to kind of build on that a little bit, to, to notice some lines from the book of Isaiah, one of the very old texts in the Old Testament, this prophecy, but Gerard draws attention to this, into this in his book, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, as kind of indicating far even before the, uh, the actual revelation of Christ, of the direction that his theory is pointing in. So let's look at it. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. So this he, this scapegoat, has taken on the pain of everybody else, and yet they consider him the one who must be punished. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was tr crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we've all gone into rivalry, if we're reading this from a Gerardian lens. We've all kind of lost our heads and gone into this frenzy of wanting what each other have. And the Lord has put all of this chaos onto this one person who will be killed. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Everybody thinks he's guilty. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So the innocence of this person. So now we're getting into the text of Battling to the End itself, which I can highly recommend. It's a kind of dense book, crazy in its scope, really. But he engages with this guy, Karl von Clausewitz, and from that begins to build a theory of European history, certainly over the last couple of hundred years, uh, quite a kind of apocalyptic theory. So one of the things he zooms in on in Clausewitz's ideas, and Clausewitz, by the way, Thomas mentioned this last time, he was a Prussian general. He has these three descriptions of what war is. First off, he calls it a duel on a large scale. So a duel is this kind of traditional aristocratic form of combat where two young men typically point guns at each other and shoot at each other or fight with each other over often a woman or some kind of insulted or You can kind of see this sense of undifferentiation that Gerard talks about in the duel. And there's also the first description of warfare, duel on a large scale, two political entities going into a duel. Then later in the book, he gives another description of war. War is politics by other means. This is quite a famous statement. And here, this is actually quite a different statement to the first one. This is the idea that actually war like politics is a thing to do with rational government policies taking into account the various people who are invested in our national state his third description then he kind of synthesizes a bit that war is a fascinating trinity of emotion chance and rational action so there's the sense of these passions but also the sense that it's something that is being controlled something that is being reasonably directed. Now, the point of Girard's analysis of Clausewitz 
and this is this is where I guess he's kind of radical. I don't think necessarily all Clausewitzian scholars would agree with this, but we're talking about Gerard, is that he thinks that this first one is actually the truest insight that Clausewitz has. It's what he starts, talks about in the start of the book. And then Gerard thinks he kind of runs away from it. So he recognizes that war is a duel on a large scale. And actually the kind of crux that Gerard thinks of Clausewitz's insight is that war hadn't always been this way. To an extent, the warfare tradition that Clausewitz was used to, the kind of aristocratic, late medieval, early modern thing, was actually a small minority of people going on to fight and there being a degree of political control over it. What begins to happen in the modern era in the 19th century and beyond is that war is increasingly taking on this aspect of just being a duel, of being a, an undifferentiated combat that is kind of taking control of other things. And that rather than it being politics by other means, it takes over. Politics just serves the interests of war. Now, why did he think this had happened? Well, massively, it's to do with this guy, Mr. Napoleon who was the French emperor at the beginning of the 19th century. So he came into power after the bloody chaotic decades of the French Revolution, where the French people had overthrown their aristocratic elite and then tried to replace them. A load of people had died and Napoleon comes in and kind of establishes a, a kind of peace over French politics. And he's not an aristocrat. He's just, he's not exactly a common guy. I think he's a military genius, but he's not the traditional person you'd expect to be in power. And then he goes on to fight wars, bloody wars all over Europe, kind of overthrowing and dispelling the old monarchies. And eventually they end up rallying their forces after he marches into Russia and kind of breaks the backbone of his army against the Russian winter which is kind of depicted in books like War and Peace. So you can actually listen, like Tchaikovsky did an amazing piece of music depicting Napoleon's march into, uh, into Russia called the, uh, the 1812 Overture. I recommend checking it out. Napoleon, I lost my trail of thought now talking about Tchaikovsky. Napoleon mobilized the French people for his wars in a way that hadn't been done before. He put in this mass conscription. So every young able-bodied man was viable for military service in his campaigns. Now, the idea that Girard is pointing out is that this is a kind of key contributor to this escalation of extremes. If you're fighting an opponent who has mobilized every single able-bodied young man, then you yourself have to mobilize every single able-bodied young man to be able to face him. You see the thing here that I kind of have to mirror him so that I'm not defeated by him. Now, Clausewitz, in Girard's view, as a military man, kind of having his career in the years after Napoleon, was deeply fascinated and haunted by the legacy of Napoleon and entered into a relationship with him like the one we, we saw at the start of Nietzsche for Wagner. So this idea that Napoleon for Clausewitz becomes this god of war. And he wants to write his text and that's his kind of intuition in this idea of war being a duel. He, he sees the future of warfare and being adopting this Napoleonic model of increasingly total, increasingly mass mobilized warfare. And this leads to or contributes to an ongoing rivalry between Fr Prussia and France. So in the 19th century, France is kind of well, certainly the early 19th century. France is the cultural superpower. They've had... Um, They've had the revolution. There's all these new ideas coming from France. And Prussia is kind of at the head of Germany as or the newly unifying Germany. Germany was historically up to this point a kind of collection of various princedoms and kingdoms. And they start to unify as the 19th century goes on with Prussia as its head. Again, Gerard kind of draws attention to the way that 
Prussian culture in many ways wanted to be France in terms of their culture, in terms of their military ambitions, in terms of their political ambitions. And I thought I'd just kind of note here as well that some of the great cultural figures from the 18th and 19th centuries are basically associated with these two countries. You can see Rousseau, Voltaire, Flaubert. I mean, my French is terrible, so excuse my pronunciation. <laughs> In Germany, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and so on and so on. So what happens when we get to the world wars? World War I starts with this assassination of the Austrian Archduke in Serbia, which is pretty shit if you're Austria, if you're the Austrian aristocracy, but it's kind of <laughs> well, like, well, what is Serbia? I mean, I'm not a historian, but whenever I kind of read about the start of World War I, it does just kind of seem like this insane, basically, escalation to extremes. And for what reason exactly? It's kind of hard to pinpoint it other than people just saying, well, I'll fight on your side, I'll fight on your side. So the Austrian Archduke is assassinated in Serbia. Austria declares war on Serbia. Russia says, well, we're fighting, we'll protect Serbia. The Germans ally with the Austrians. And then, then I forget what happens with France, but basically either France jumps in because they're allied with Russia as well, or Germany declares war on France as well. But it's interesting to note, I was just reading this the other day, that Germany basically had a plan from 1905. So from nine years before this war started, that they thought would allow them to annihilate France in four weeks. Now, in terms of what we've just been talking about, this like Prussian-French rivalry and the desire to both be the supreme military power and also what we kind of know from thinking about the story of Cain and Abel and the desire to just destroy my rival so I can have what he has. This kind of fantasy of destroying France in four weeks is kind of, well, at least interesting to think about. And of course, what happens is that doesn't happen. Instead, there's four years of trench warfare between these two rivals on the French-German frontier. Millions of people die. The Americans and the Brits get involved. And it's like, what was that really about? World War II, well, this, the grounds for this are laid in what happens after World War I. So you've got the Treaty of Versailles where the Germans basically have to accept war guilt. Their army is weakened, their economy is crippled because they have to pay a crazy amount of money to France as reparations for the war. And also the Rhineland, which is the territory on the west of Germany, east of France, that kind of borders the two, is demilitarized. And that was kind of historically quite an economically powerful area for Germany. I think it's got lots of coal, I think. Um, something to note here is that the French were very aggressive in putting these, uh, these terms on Germany, whereas the USA and Britain were much more moderate. I mean, I think basically the USA actually on the one hand, had capital investments in Germany. They wanted German industry to boom again after the war. And also they thought that actually having this great power be so weakened and actually so humiliated by the terms of the treaty might not be a good idea. But France was very big on basically saying, our country has been destroyed by this country. Um, we don't want it to happen again. <laughs> thinking in terms of rivalry okay I mean, these two guys are still kind of going no i don't want them to be powerful again hitler invades the rhineland in 1935 i mean hitler kind of comes to power partly on the back of trying to make germany great again literally after the humiliation of the treaty of versailles he's like no we're not going to accept this we're going to break the terms we're going to make germany into what historically it's supposed to be and the Allies do nothing to this invasion. And Girard's got quite an interesting analysis of this that we'll see on the next page. And then from there, Hitler builds up his forces, invades Czechoslovakia, invades Poland. And it's at this point that the Brits declare war on Germany. And then <sighs> millions more people are dying, right? So I've got this text here. And Annoyingly, I've got this bar at the top of my screen that um, is kind of slightly in the way. 
Maybe I'm gonna, oops. Yeah. Okay, I hope you can still see that, but I still got that zoom bar. The primacy of defense over offense gives us one of the clues to the situation. This is the outbreak of World War II. The defender is the one who wants war. The attacking side wants peace. In the case at hand, in 1923, the French wanted to keep what they had acquired from victory in World War I, a precarious peace that they were ready to defend at any price and for which they would invade Germany. Their population was already dropping and they became warmongers out of pacifism. Hitler was then in a strong position because he was invaded first. He did not invade the Rhineland by rearming it, but responded to aggression against his country. Rearming the Rhineland was his first counterattack, and it was to prove decisive. It was thus the French desire for peace that caused the new trend to extremes. That's a weird thought to think about. Without realizing it, they perpetuated the absurdity of Verdun. That was one of the biggest battles of the First World War. They continued building their monuments to the dead without really thinking about what had just taken place. Their arrogance as petty victors could only exasperate their adversary. France was continuing to act like Napoleon, who had invaded Germany to maintain peace. It had not understood anything. So here we see that guy again, Napoleon, still haunting these two great military powers a century later. Hitler did not understand anything either when he redirected his offense to the East after his brilliant victory over France. And in time, he was to make the same mistake as Napoleon invading Russia, where his forces were also weakened fatally. This is a perfect example of what I call misapprehension. The more I want peace, in other words, the more I want to conquer, then the more I seek to assert my difference and the more I prepare a war that I will not control but that will control me instead. This is how undifferentiation becomes worldwide, how mimetic violence grows behind the backs of those involved. This is much more real than the Hegelian bruise of reason and much less abstract than Heidegger's and framing of the world by technology. Clausewitz is the key to understanding this. I really like that passage. And I think these lines, the more I want peace, the more I want to conquer, then the more I seek to assert my difference, the more I kind of try and say that my way is the way, my way or the highway, in other words, take it or face the consequences. The more I actually create space for the person I'm trying to conquer to fight back. And then at which point, this point, we're in a war that neither of us is controlling. We're in this dual political motivations, our ability to think rationally about the conflict increasingly goes out the window. And just on a side note here, so Girard's critique of Hegel is essentially that, as far as I understand it, Hegelians assume that if you have two opposing principles in ideas or in combat, then eventually the, the tension between them, the conflict between them will resolve in something productive. There'll be a new third term, there'll be something that sublates the dialectical difference and brings them together. Gerard says, what if this is a nice fantasy, but actually all having two principles that a fighting does is lead to ever more fighting without ever resolving it? And this is actually kind of one of the questions that in terms of our philosophical community, it's kind of at the core of it at the moment, this argument between Hegel and Gerard, which uh, we saw a bit of last night between uh, Cadell and Thomas. Moving on. This is just kind of funny, but also just weird. I noticed this when I was Googling around about Hitler and Napoleon, that apparently, and admittedly, I haven't actually checked these dates, but there's loads of memes saying it. So I don't know, trust memes or not. Apparently, they were born 129 years apart, came into power 129 years apart, and declared war on Russia 129 years apart. Whether or not this is true, it's certainly at least noticeable that this great 19th century military commander, as we've kind of the theory that we've been going through without this talk on Girard's book, is that 
the Prussian general Clausewitz, who became so influential in the elite German military circles and political circles, saw Napoleon as his model. And then Hitler is going to war, massive war against France, copies Napoleon's mistake of trying to invade Russia. It's funny, right? So since then, what's happened with conflict? Well, on the one hand, we've had nuclear weapons, which kind of ended the, the world war and left us in this kind of Cold War stalemate where the great powers, especially the USSR and the USA, are stockpiling nuclear weapons, which on the one hand has kind of made open warfare between the great powers just suicidal in terms of thinking of a duel we basically have two people pointing guns at each other but the guns will not just destroy them but will destroy the entire fucking world at the same time however we've seen the emergence of all of these weird new forms of conflict like on the one hand asymmetrical us and indeed western military forces showing up in places all over basically the third world and doing these peacekeeping missions and i mean sometimes there's reasons for being there dubious reasons for being there depending on what you think about politics sometimes it's like what the fuck is going on there why are they there um, what are they trying to achieve i mean i think the the recent u.s evacuation of afghanistan was just a kind of example of like what the fuck was going on there and what did they achieve there what was all that money what was all those fighting about and then on the right hand side you see this other phenomenon which is terrorism people blowing themselves up in capitals for ideological reasons and again this is a form of kind of asymmetric attack upon a very weak foe in a sense like civilians they don't have a way to defend themselves against someone blowing themselves up and i think there's almost a kind of mirror imagery between this as well this is the new stakes of conflict you go into a land that doesn't really have the capacity to protect itself that well and wage asymmetric warfare and then just notice this because that passage i spoke about earlier the more i want peace in other words the more i want to conquer the more i seek to assert my difference the more i prepare a war that i will not control but that will control me instead That's a lens to think about what, say, happened in this conflict with, on the one hand, in the West, often we don't identify so much with nations anymore, but there is a strong sense of the West, and sometimes a sense of the Western way being the best or the democratic way being the best, asserting a difference and a, trying to establish a peace through asserting a difference, a difference that says our way is the best, but ultimately preparing this war that will not be controlled, but that will control instead. And you could almost say the same thing for Islam as well. There's a kind of desire to assert the, well, certainly for the more radical wing, wings of Islam, which is by no means all of it. But if I'm thinking about the kind of terrorism, at seeking to assert a genuine difference and wanting the peace, say, of a universal caliphate, ultimately just preparing a war that will control them again. This is also a lens to think about the culture wars, for example. The more I seek to assert my difference, the more I prepare a war that I will not control, but will control me instead. So whether it's asserting your difference in terms of some kind of oppressed identity, or whether it's asserting actually the validity of your nation or your culture. And this shows us a very tricky territory. And I mean, I don't even know what exactly the correct way to think about this is because it does seem like in many circumstances there's genuine struggle for identities to be recognized there's genuine struggle for saying my way is perhaps better than your way but then how do we manage these conflicts in a way that doesn't just lead to all-out war against war and I don't think anyone has the answer to that right now. That's what essentially the problem of the culture war is. 
So what's going on here? If we're going back to this kind of theoretical way of thinking about it. If I'm seeming to have what others want, be that talent or a peaceful nation or a great way of doing things or an identity that is strong or that needs to be spoken for finally, I'm asserting some kind of difference from others. And in asserting a kind of difference from others, especially if it's a difference that seems like a positive difference, I present myself as having something that others would want. And so if we kind of going with Gerard's theory, others are going to mimic me and or envy me, probably both, possibly the same people doing both. And similarly, the more I view others as having what I want, the more I'll mimic them and or envy them. And I kind of noticed myself having done this in my own life countless times, like growing up. The first thing I wanted to be, I wanted to be one of the guys from Metallica. And then I had this almost like painful experience of not being one of the musicians from Metallica. On the one hand, it's like, yes, those guys have the best thing. And when I feel like I'm playing guitar really well, I can imagine myself being one of these guys. And then, and then the next thing is no. And it's actually painful, not just to listen to their music, but to listen to any music, because all listening to any music does is remind me of the fact that I'm not them. I mean, and this is what I think I'd like us to think about when we go to breakout rooms is where are we mimetic in our own lives? Um, what are the models that we adopt consciously or unconsciously and what kind of ridiculous struggles, pains do we feel because of it? So just start thinking about that because we're drawing to the end of the presentation now. And again, so kind of, thinking from a bit more of a summarizing perspective. So Christianity, according to Gerard's view, a sutric religion, we might say, broke the sacrificial pagan religion. We can no longer pacify mobs through scapegoating. We can no longer de-escalate conflict unanimously through scapegoating. Our sutric religion, Christianity in the West, has largely broken down. So the prohibitions and the practices that we would have used to prevent mimetic rivalries getting out of hand, we don't believe in them anymore. The prohibitions we tend to think of just being archaic remnants of patriarchal ways of doing things often. And the practices are just kind of seen as woo. We keep battling over identity and models stirring up mimetic rivalry. And I think if you just think about culture in the last 60 years or so, there's been more and more about identity and expressing yourself and being unique, being authentic. Consumer freedoms have given us a lot of that. So many new ways to, to be a person and to, to identify. This is what I talked about in one of my previous presentations. And at the same time, we've also got, as Thomas mentioned last time, a technology, stuff like Instagram, stuff like YouTube, that means we can see everybody. So I can literally go on into Instagram and see a reality TV star and see her supposedly perfect life where she drinks four pound espressos and has green cakes and thinks that, and, and posts pictures of them on Instagram and be like, God damn it, why am I not going out with a beautiful woman who eats green cakes? Um, we keep seeking scapegoats, but they fail to de-escalate our conflict. So this is the other thing. This is kind of what we see happening, say, in the culture wars, where there's always someone who's guilty. If you're, say, on the woke side, perhaps you think it's white men, or if you're on the anti-woke side, perhaps you think it's woke people. <laughs> but ultimately, it's not working, and it's just getting crazier. Now, I'm going to go, I think, yeah, we've got a couple more passages of Gerard here on these very topics. So this is, again, from Battling to the End. And these are probably some of, I think, the most profound passages in the book. And also probably where Gerard is at his most spiritual. He's talking about the uh, 19th century poet Holderlin, who was a contemporary of, I think, Hegel and a couple of the other philosophers. And he was hanging around with them, but then basically isolated himself for decades and had quite a powerful religious conversion and wrote some very um, deep religious poetry. 
Holderlin felt that the incarnation was the only means available to humanity to face God's very salubrious silence. Christ's questioned that silence on the cross. And then he himself imitated his father's withdrawal by joining him on the morning of his resurrection. Christ saves humanity by breaking his solar scepter. He withdraws at the very point when he could dominate. We, in turn, are thus required to experience the peril of the absence of God, the modern experience par excellence, because it is the time of sacrificial temptation, the possible regression to extremes, but it is also a redemptive experience. To imitate Christ is to refuse to impose oneself as a model and to always efface oneself before others. To do imitate Christ is to do everything to avoid being imitated to be as non-mimetic as possible. It was thus God's silence that can be heard in that of the poet, in terms of the poet's withdrawal. The death of the gods, which so frightens Nietzsche, is simply the same thing as an essential withdrawal in which Christ asks us to see the new face of the divine. Mimetic theory has allowed us to conclude that the purpose of the incarnation was to finish all religions whose sacrificial crutches have become effective, ineffective, rather. So he's saying that the option left to us in a time of rampant mimetic rivalry when scapegoating to, to reduce conflict, to solve conflict no longer works. The only option is to do something like imitating Christ. And what Christ, imitating Christ means in Gerard's frame is not imposing oneself as a model and not taking others as models. We've got another passage here, and this is the only other long passage I'm going to read, so don't worry. What the poet understood when he was on the point of leaving the mimetic giddiness of worldly experience, the ups and downs of which he experienced with terrible intensity, as his fascination with Goethe and Schiller proves, or with Metallica, <laughs> is that salvation lies in imitating Christ. In other words, in imitating the withdrawal relationship that links him with his father. The relationship sanctifies while reciprocity sacralizes by creating ties that are too strong. Reciprocity kind of likes trading blow for blow. Holderlin was in a better position than anybody else to understand this, but he had suffered so much from the models he had adopted. Christ is the only one who immediately places us at the right distance. He is simultaneously near and difficult to grasp. His presence is not proximity. He teaches us to look at others by identifying ourselves with Christ, that's the big age, which prevents us from oscillating between too great proximity to and too great distance from the other who we imitate. If we were to identify with the other, we would be imitating him in an intelligent manner. So avoiding the resentment and the will to power or the sense of dominating the other and just having a productive relationship. Imitating Christ thus means thwarting all rivalry, taking distance from the divine by giving it the father's face. We are brothers in Christ. In this, Christ completed what the pagan gods had only sketched. As he sank into the withdrawal of his father, Christ invited each of us to model our will on that of his father. To listen to the father's silence is to abandon oneself to his withdrawal, to conform to it. Becoming a son of God means imitating this withdrawal, experiencing it with Christ. God is thus not immediately accessible, but immediately through his son and the story of the salvation, which we, as we have seen, takes on the paradoxical appearance of an escalation to extremes. The salvation appears and destroys the very thing that prevents the escalation to extremes, the scapegoating mechanism, in other words. And the solution for Gerard is to listen to the father's silence, abandoning ourselves to, his, to the withdrawal. Again, kind of not seeking gods and not seeking to create gods in the form of scapegoats who thus unify us. It's quite a radical vision of what it actually means to be a Christian. It's kind of like this, to imitate Christ is to be in the place where God has abandoned us. Uh, 
and more stuff at the top. I think this slide kind of just says what I just said there. Yeah, so pagans, God is the name for killing of the other scapegoat, which creates peace. The Christians, God is withdrawn, killing the scapegoat and creates more conflict. Yeah, yeah, we touched on that. Now, just as a kind of last couple of thoughts, the limitation of Gerard is that he is only talking about Christianity, but he was he did himself admit that, and Thomas said this last time, that it must be in other traditions too, practices and ways to avoid mimetic rivalry. And I think Andrew can probably tell us more about this because he's a practicing Buddhist. Um, but Buddhism seems to have the same thing in the sense that you, you, you don't worship Buddha as far as I understand it, but Buddha is the, the representation of a consciousness that has realized the the kind of nature of desire and the absurdity of chasing after it and has reached a state of being of just kind of spontaneously manifesting compassion for the situations and for the people he encounters and the idea of this thing on the left is a um it's a buddhist prayer or mantra i got it from chogyam trungpa this idea of i take refuge in the buddha Buddha meaning both, yes, this figure, but also this idea that Buddha consciousness is within all of us. It's the idea of being, I guess, in the seeing through desire and being in that compassionate stance to being. Take refuge in the Dharma. This means being in acceptance of all of the situations that appear in life. And so being able to act in the situations, maybe changing them if necessary, but not out of a sense of this situation is totally wrong. And right now I'm in total misery and that person over there has everything and I need to become like that person. It's like, no, this situation right here is the situation that you're supposed to be in. You work with this situation rather than trying to be in that person's situation, renouncing mimeticism and then taking refuge in the Sangha. This means taking refuge in a spiritual community around you who are trying to live harmonious lives rather than destructive mimetic lives who are actually kind of trying to practice together and help each other to notice their unconscious patterns and the ways that they're deluding themselves and tripping themselves up and I just thought I'd end with this poem that I realized yesterday. It's an ancient poem by the Latin author Catullus. And it kind of touches on everything that mimetic theory is about. So it goes like this. Odi et amo, quare id faciam fortasse vequiris. Nescio, sed fieri sentio et excrucio. I hate and I love. Why do I do this? Perhaps you ask. I don't know, but I feel it's this way and I'm tortured by it. And that is the end of my presentation.